A very good afternoon to one and all gathered here. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome all of you in the one-day webinar program organized by Law College Durgapur on the topic women <coughs> and uh, crime. It's illegal analysis. We are fortunate enough that we are getting physical and moral support from a wide range of people like academician, business tycoon, legal luminaries, and students. We have a panel of resource person who happens to have expertise in different aspects of legal studies. Now, I welcome uh, our honorable GM, sir, to grace the occasion. Sir, please. Stars sign at night. Some stars sign bright at delight. It's a pleasure to welcome such a star. I welcome uh, Professor Dr. Manik Chakrabarti, ex HOD and Professor, Department of Law, Baduan University, and ex director, UGC Academic Staff College, Baduan University. Welcome to you, sir. I wholeheartedly welcome Professor uh, Dr. Chintamuni Raut, Professor and Head of the Department, Department of Law, Nehu, Shilong, Meghalaya. Sir, keep, us in, keep on influencing us. <clears throat> the essence of leadership is great influence, not authority. With this note, I wholeheartedly welcome Professor Dr. Sanjeev Kumar Tiwari, ex HOD and Professor, Department of Law, Badwan University. See, who puts his soul and heart in uplifting others deserves dignity. Welcome uh, to Professor Dr. Kiswar Parvin, Principal, Law College, Durgapur. Welcome, ma'am. Last but not the least, I would like to welcome on behalf of Law College, Durgapur, all the faculties of Law College, Durgapur, for your wholehearted support. Thanks once again to one and all. Now I request uh, Professor Dr. Kiswar Parvin, Principal Man, Law College Durga, to Madam, please. Good afternoon, all. Uh, I would like to surely apologize for the inconvenience caused by a technical default. I feel really honored on behalf of Law College Durgapur to inaugurate one day national webinar on the topic entitled Crime Against Women in India Recent Challenges and Issues. See, if we look through the stages of this society, we can see that these years we commemorate 25 years since the Beijing Declaration and platform for the ever since <laughs> unprecedented challenges of COVID-19 that perils the progressive growth of women and children. But still, we are lacking on the crisis behind us because there's a close connection between that of the pandemic and the increased growth of victim violence against women. Violence against women is a socially, economically, developmental, educational, legal, human rights and health issues. There is a paradigm beyond the myth. So I feel honored on part of Law College Durgapur to welcome all of you and all the participants who have joined here. And I want your active participation during this session. Today we'll be hearing so much precious speech from all the legal luminaries and we can call them as the legends of the law. So without wasting much time, I would like to invite Mr. GM Sir of Rahul Foundation to speak few words and to throw some lights on this. Thank you. 
So let's start. A very good afternoon to Principal Madam and the entire team member of Law College who already organized this uh, seminar, which is need of the day. And not only that, during this COVID situation, I am very much uh, hopeful to my college, especially Law College. They are continuously organizing such type of webinar as well as seminar, online seminar. And today, the, uh, the topic they have chosen, that is crime against women in India, recent issues and challenges, is definitely an uh, emerging topic and having a great impact over the society. Now, the growth and development of women, the power of India <coughs> depends on certain issues, just like education and other aspects. We know that our country, India, right now is a developing country and our country is having so many issues. One of the prominent issue is nothing but how to protect our women forces, how to protect our women forces from different aspects. The major aspect is nothing but the challenges recent that is crime aspect over women. Recently, we have seen certain issues in Uttar Pradesh where it is a, something happened with some uh, or the scheduled caste women and which were having a very extreme impact over the entire country. But my dear students as well as the learned faculty members who are present in this webinar, I request all of you, as I know that most of them are very learned faculty members over here, just prevention of such type of issues, just like crime. What type of crime? Say, for example, crime that is sexual harassment at workplace, crime related to acid attack, crime related to rape, though we are having some preventive, is preventive factors just like legal support. Say, for example, sexual harassment and workplace, IPC 1860, section 294 to 354, 354A, 509, through this we can provide safeguard. Acid attack, that is IPC section 100, rape, and so many sections, so many support, legal support is there. But I think legal support, okay, it's fine. It is not enough. Before that, we'll have to generate awareness. And such type of awareness, so that we should remove this type of evil, this type of negative culture among our society, amongst our society. So what we have to do, the main and foremost thing that is the education of the student, mainly the girl student, which is very much important. Education of girl students, as we are aware that it is increasing day by day in our country, and our country is progressing in this area. The different state and central appropriate governments, they have taken certain important lucrative, <laughs> that is, uh, schemes for girls, students' education and their development. But still, we believe that it is not at all sufficient. Then their marriage age, though it is fixed by the government through different laws and everything, but still we are watching that below 18, Lot of managers are taking place in different parts of country. And not only that, we are having different apps to protect the different legal issues as well as the challenges they are facing in workplace. But still, I think it is not sufficient. But, last, but at last, I would like to just quote something word that this issue is a burning issue. These challenges are burning challenges. And we'll have to do awareness. And awareness, how it is possible? 
possible not only through different schemes of the government, not only the social workers, the NGOs that are working at mass level, but still this awareness is also possible through this type of webinar, this type of seminars. This is also a mode of awareness. And I hope that my law college is doing this same, this noble work for this nation. And again and again, I am thankful to the learned faculty members, the speakers who are present over here, will deliver their, will share their knowledge as well as the team law college headed by the principal law college as well as the advisor mm -hmm. law college. And I hope in future they will definitely arrange and organize such type of seminar and they will try to amalgamate all such type of educational issues and send the message to the nation as well as the society. Thank you. Hmm? Where is Please come. <laughs> Well, thank you, sir, for giving us such a valuable speech. And now I would like to uh, call upon uh, Sean Ali to uh, introduce some other legal resource person and on this issue. Now over to Sean Ali. Thank you, Principal Ma'am. I am Shonali Dotto, uh, Assistant Professor, Law College, Durgapur. I would like to welcome a very distinguished personality from the legal fraternity and our today's first resource person, Professor Dr. Mani Chakraborty. It is a very, I'm highly honored to welcome you, sir. And he was a former professor and head department of law, University of Bordhuman. He has also been the director of UGC Academic Staff College, Bordhuman. Uh, and the controller of examination, Bordhuman University, he has also worked as an advisor in Amity Law School. He has almost a teaching experience of 35 years and has also written three books and over 40 journals in, in various written papers at various journals. So as an expert appointed by UGC on the human rights, there could be no other person best suited for him to deliver some speech regarding mm -hmm. the topic. So, sir, I would like to request you to enlighten our audience on the national webinar on the topic crime against women, recent issues and challenges. Uh, thank you, sir. And over to you, sir. <clears throat> thank you, Sir Nali. Uh, so, uh, really, it's my great honor and privilege that uh, today I've been invited by the local is Durgapur to say a few words on a very pertinent topic of the day, crime against women in India, recent issues and challenges. Actually, uh, first of all, uh, before starting my lecture, I convey my regards to the GM of, lo of uh, this local is Durgapur and also the principal local is Durgapur and also uh, other uh, faculty members of the local is Durgapur and all the students of local is Durgapur Especially, I also convey my heartfelt thanks to Dr. Shoshinath Mondal, who actually has uh, arranged all these things, I believe, because he called me and requested me to say something. So immediately I have agreed, you know, because he is very dear to me, Shoshinath Mondal, and very active also. And uh, Parvin Kiswar also is very active as a principal. She is doing very good, of course. I'm very happy. As she was my student in Allah in Bordhavan University, and uh, also all the distinguished, uh, you know, speaker of this session, uh, Professor Chintamuni Raut, uh, my greetings to you, sir. Oh, after a long days, I'm seeing you, <laughs> and uh, so congratulations to you, and uh, also uh, Professor Dr. Sanjeev Kumar Tiwari, my uh, very close friend of Bardhavan University. So this is nice that today we are here, uh, you know, to speak on a very important topic, you know, that is crime against women in India, especially the recent issues and challenges. Actually, uh, just now we have heard, uh, you know, uh, that uh, our GM, 
sir has mentioned that uh, recently on 18 december 2020 the cbi has filed its charge sheet on the hatras gang gang rape case where a dolit girl was gang raped and ultimately you know she was murdered you know and uh, so like this is just one incident but uh, if uh, we take uh, you know the whole year you know even especially after the lockdown period due to you know covid-19 this pandemic then of course you know we'll get the whole picture so horrible picture that how this women they are being tortured you know and uh, also raped and uh, harassed you know so this is uh, uh, when we are thinking you know when we are celebrating 25 that is uh, um there is 20 of uh, five years of uh, this beijing declaration because 1995 the fourth uh, world conference on women that was held in beijing and uh, then all the world leaders they have adopted beijing declaration and uh, you know in that conference where a number of proposals have been initiated and adopted by the world leaders for the protection of women in the world their human rights and all these things now interestingly when we are talking of women it is true that uh, the status of women you know uh, in our ancient scriptures it was a uh, on a, on a very high level of course she was worshiped as shakti or adi shakti manu dharma you know shastra manu shastra proclaims that the deities delight in places where women are revered so manu equaled women with goddesses there is no difference at all between the goddess of good fortune who live in houses and women who are the lamps of their houses worthy of reverence and greatly blessed because of their progeny many scholars social reformist human rights activist both nationally and internationally advocated for equal status of women as we have seen since the inception of the united nations now but one thing here i must say before you that all these descriptions of mythological majesty proclamation of philosophical parlance and consideration of constitutional dignity of women what we have found for last 4 or 5 decades i'm sure that remain a paper glory i'm bound to say this this, this remains a paper glory according to justice a s anand once he remarked that the ground reality is that equality of opportunity or of status of women is more in the books than in the mores of the community in male dominant society women always suffer humility and cruelty in the hands of mighty uh, uh, man she is considered as inferior object and is subject to dominance and domestic suppression and public oppression physical assault mental agony and emotional outburst it is not only in india but a whole worldwide phenomena and this fear of violence caused lack of participation of most women in every facet of life once justice dia kishnaya lamented by asking the question few women lawyers why few women judges why very few women professors why if we take the present situation in india just imagine out of 34 judges in the supreme court of india only the two judges are women so you can easily you know see the whole scenario recently on 8 december at the farewell function of the chief justice of jammu and kashmir the first women chief justice of jammu and kashmir justice geeta mittal she boldly you know raised this issue by telling that there are lot of discrimination you know in the employment of higher judiciary which is totally dominated by men so this is true that you know when we are talking in terms of crime also because crime against women vary in every phase of their lives starting from 
female feticide to infanticide, rapes on minors, rapes on young and old women, gang rapes, marital rapes, outrage of modesty of women, human trafficking of women and children, forced prostitution, honor killing, domestic violence, bright burning, acid attacks, child marriage, sexual harassment at workplace, etc. etc. Justice Krishnaya once lamented again from fatal state to final exit, from the cradle to the grave, these women are always the victims of justice. In international forum, of course, I must say that there are a number of important human rights instruments have been adopted by the United Nations since the inception in 1945. And especially, I must mention here, if we see the UN Charter of the UN Charter, we will nicely find that clearly mentioned that, you know, to reaffirm our fundamental human rights, to reaffirm the equality of all men and women, the world leaders have established this United Nations so that our next generation cannot witness the scars of war, what we have witnessed twice in our lifetime. So, this is the, you know, ultimate aim of the United Nations to promote equality among all the people, whether it is men or women, on the, without any discrimination on the basis of caste, creed, race, and language or religion. At the same time, I can remember, I can mention here the Universal Declaration of Human Rights adopted in 1948, 10th December, where in, under Article 1, it is clearly proclaimed that all men and women are born equal in their dignity and respect. And interestingly, if we take, take the in initiatives taken by the United Nations, we can uh, also mention, you know, that in 1979, the United Nations General Assembly has adopted one most important human rights law for the protection of women, that is, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial, of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, 1979. Because discrimination against women violates the principles of equality of rights and respect for human dignity. And uh, of course, well, as we have seen already four world uh, women conferences were held under the auspices of the United Nations. The first one was held in 1975 in the Mexico City. The second one was held in, at Copenhagen in 1980. The third one was held at N Mexico City, Nairobi, sorry, in 1985. And fourth one was at Beijing, 1995. And uh, as I told just now, that the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action is an agenda for women's empowerment and considered key global policy document on gender equality. Besides, we can also mention here, in 1993, the United Nations has adopted the most important declaration on the elimination of violence against women. Now, there are a number of international conventions and declarations which are relating to women for their empowerment, for their protection, and to do justice to this half of the population of the world, these women. Now, if we take uh, the, the case of India, again, of course, in India also, you know, there, there, are no, there are plethoras of laws and legislations, policies adopted by the government of India. And uh, for the first time, if I can mention, I can mention the Indian Constitution, where there are a number of provisions, starting from Article 14, Article 15, Article 15, Clause 3, Article 16. There are a number of provisions, you know, mentioned in the Indian Constitution. Besides, we have a number of specific laws also in uh, for the protection of women. And also there are certain laws and certain provisions mentioned in the Indian Penal Code, where, you know, there are certain provisions for the protection of women against the crime. Now, we have also, you know, uh, on trafficking, we have this Immoral Trafficking Prevention Act of 1986. We have Dowry Prevention Act 1961, Equal Remuneration Act. We have Sexual Harassment at Workplace 2013. We have Medical Termination of Pregnancy Act 1972. We have Preconception and Prenatal Diagnostic Techniques Act 1984. And also we have the Domestic Violence Act 2005. Now, 
in, in of all these things of, of all these laws we have a number of laws and number of policies but still it is very important to say that uh, in spite of all these plethora of laws in india the, the women are not at all safe let us just take the example of you know few last few months you know when uh, the the whole world is suffering from this corona pandemic here i must say that the wretched pandemic has stirred up a hornet's nest among the different hierarchical societal strata and among them in all of the areas the pandemic has exposed the condition of domain of women safety in india especially based on ncrb data national crime record bureau's annual report of 2019 an article from the indian express reported a spike in the cases of crimes against women in india by 7.3% a total of 4 lakh lakh 5861 cases taking the crime rate registered per lakh women from 58.8% to 62.4% in 2019 the hindu <clears throat> once reported that uh, that 1147 registered cases of domestic violence between march 25 to may 31st 2020 the see the situation only this uh, how much march 25 that is the day starting from lockdown till 31st may hardly few months uh, only two and uh, some some days two months some days alone there were 1147 registered cases of domestic violence you know alone sexual violence at an unparalleled 80.6% it would not be wrong to say that with the inception of the nationwide lockdown in the month of march 2020 what was envisaged as the safest confinement turned quite the opposite especially in case of women as you have seen in india the emergence and spread of covid-19 has made women and girls especially vulnerable to the increased violence and abuse owing to the limitations on their movement that keep women isolated from support services and friends and in close proximity with their perpetrators confined inside the home often in situations of increased economic and psychological stress it is said that globally one in three women experiences physical and sexual violence in a lifetime mostly in the form of intimate partner violence and this has undoubtedly increased during the ongoing crisis of perna con this per this our uh, uh, corona pandemic now here i must say that uh, the chapters the comparison can be drawn from the number of complaints hit by the national commission for women between february 27 and march 22 being 396 and between march 23 to april 13 see only one month maybe there was there the case of 587 cases the national commission for women received more than 13000 complaints of crimes against women during this lockdown period uh, as per data compiled by the ministry of women and child development which was presented in the lok sabha last session of lok sabha according to the chairperson of national women's commission Ms. Rekha Sharma, the high number can be attributed to, to the lockdown imposed due to the co- coronavirus outbreak, which has locked the abuser and the victim together. From the above data, it is clear that while being locked in the houses, accidents and other crimes have reduced to some extent. But on the other hand, gender-based violence has increased massively. Recently, the National Women's Commission chairperson commented on the status of West Bengal here, I must say, which registered more than 260 complaints, including so many cases, saying the only some situation in West Bengal is police don't reply and no action has been taken on the complaints. Neither the Director General of Police nor the Chief Secretary meets me, and this is not the first time they send their subordinates who are. clueless about the crime she further added that the body will submit details of over 260 complaints from west bengal to the minister of home affairs government of india for further action 
if the state administration fails to respond on them within 15 days. See this situation in West Bengal also. The commission also raised concerns about the rising problem of trafficking of women in India, especially also in West Bengal, as there are a number of cases we have seen in the newspapers, you know, after the Ampan that, uh, st uh, and uh, crisis and also during this corona pandemic that uh, many young girls and uh, boys are now being trafficked because you know, to other places in India due to the poverty and economic crisis during this corona period as there was no work and uh, they had to stay inside the home. They could not come out. So when they are dying in starvation, so there was no way out left. So many young girls and boys have been trafficked in many places of uh, Sundarban area and uh, other areas of West Bengal from Dinaspur and other areas, as we have seen in the newspapers. Many NGOs are now actively working to save these children, those who have trafficked from West Bengal. Now, recently, an article from the Economic Times reported 1,273 acid attack cases still October, October 20, of which only 726 cases are provided with medical assistance in India. In another case from October 2020, a woman, Tara Yadav, lost a police complaint against four of his bearers of a certain political party, including the district president, for allegedly beating and molesting her in Uttar Pradesh, Deuria district, after she claimed that a rapist had been given the ticket for the assembly by election. While the party threw acquisition of political conspiracy, but the video circulated in social media platforms had an entirely different story. Here we have seen the political connection, nexus with the criminals when compared with the issue of gender-based violence. It was recently reported that a 17-year-old girl was brutally raped and killed in Uttar Pradesh, looking for the end of two such similar crimes from the district in a matter of just 10 days. The first one occurred in August 15, they do we, we celebrate the country's independence, when a 13-year-old Elizabeth Dolit girl was raped and thrown in the fields with her eyes gauzed out and tongue slit. News of another rape came from Uttar Pradesh, Sitapur area, where three teenage boys and seven, 716 molestation cases in Karnataka. So this is the situation in India. And uh, if we take now Uttar Pradesh and Delhi reported the highest number of the complaints filed with the National Commission of Women during this lockdown period. Together, these states accounted for over half, that is 53.45% of the cases, along with Uttar Pradesh and Delhi. Other three states, including Maharashtra, Haryana, and Bihar, make 70% of the complaints registered by women during this lockdown period. The rest of the states and union territories have less than 1,000 cases during the same period. 16 states have more than 100 and uh, up to 1,000 cases, while 17 states and union territories have reported less than 100 cases. The northeastern region, of course, saw only 74 such complaints with National Commission for Women. As seen in the figure, with, with the, and uh, here I must say again, a majority of the cases go unreported, of course, on going to various impediments from technological to societal. Complaints to National Commission for Women during this uh, owing to various impediments uh, uh, during uh, received during this uh, period through WhatsApp, emails and calls. This is highly problematic as there is a huge gender gap in India when it comes to access to mobile phones and the internet. With only 43% of the women owning a phone compared to 80% of, of men. A recent UNICEF report found that only 29% of Indian women have access to the internet. Just see and imagine the situation. That's why this increase in incidence of gender-based violence, Jagori, a Delhi-based NGO, has witnessed a drop in calls on its helplines, in helpline numbers by 50%. This could be because of the fear of getting discovered by their offenders at home, according to Jaya Balenkar the director of Jaguri. So the first research for a victim of domestic violence is usually the family members or her, or her canes, but the support is seldom offered 
when compared to their unsolicited and downright ridiculous mitigation advice between the victim and the abuser now again i must say that in order to fight this menace and um, and to empower its women the indian government in the last 6 months during this uh, pandemic period has undertaken a number of initiatives like one step centers universalization of women helpline ujjwala homes uh, then emergency response support system 112 and various authorities under women centric laws such as the protection of women from domestic violence act 2005 the dowry prohibition act 1961 the prohibition of child marriage act 2006 etc now from the beginning of the lockdown due to covid 19 pandemic the national commission for women launched an ad campaign through electronic media and social media inviting women who have suffered any kind of violence to come forward and report it and simultaneously launched a whatsapp number 72177353720 on 10th april 2020 for reporting domestic violence cases now it is of course uh, true that india suffers severely from policy paralysis i must say here even if the government's managed to draft a legislation and pass it into an act a majority of the educated population remain oblivious to them this is irony of course let alone the marginalized and backward sections uh, are, are, are concerned there is an urgent need now i feel to work at the grassroots levels here in india of course in conclusion i must say that when we are talking of all these laws and all these things as i have discussed a number of incidents happened you know um, that is crime against women in india during this pandemic period i must say that these instances are only tip of an iceberg there is no doubt of extensive conventions and deliberations as i have mentioned there is no doubt of legislative enactments no doubt of judicial pronouncement in india and also thought provoking and soul searching writings by the eminent scholars for the protection of women against atrocities and uh, court pronouncement judgments legislature makes appropriate laws but ultimate the ultimate organ for their ap- effective implementation is the executive so which needs needs you know determined will with adequate power and of course laws with strong teeth le- leaving no loopholes not only for the perpetrators to escape but also for them to think twice before entrapping victim and at the end i must say that public participation and public awareness against the crime you know this types of crime also is very much needed at present so i believe that this is high time when we are discussing all these issues of crime against women we must not forget that half of the world's population are women those who are the victims of this human rights violation so when we are thinking up the dream you know, our cherished by our constitution makers in the indian, indian constitution that the state will render justice to all social economic and political so once this justice is established for all then only we can dream for a ram rajya in india every people will be happy and the ultimate the the focus of upanishad that sarve bhavantu sukhina that will be fulfilled so let us unite and fight against the crime of crime against women in the world and especially in india so with these words i ho- i again thank the organizers i am grateful to them to for giving me this chance to uh, discuss a few points on these issues and uh, so again Thank you all. Thank you very much. Namaskar to all. Thank you, sir, for such a beautiful, informative session. You have beautifully stressed the status of women from the ancient India to the modern era, and various case laws that have you have brought up in the recent newspapers and the condition of women during the pandemic period. And sir, as you have beautifully stated, that the law should have with a strong teeth is very much the necessity. 
of uh, the present indian uh, constitution or other uh, statutes related to uh, women so we would it was beautiful suggestions given by you sir and we, it would be very nice that if the indian government and the uh, we people as public work upon it uh, or get more aware of these things that you have said and thank you sir once again for uh, such a beautiful session and uh, we'll start with the next session uh, thank you Good afternoon everyone our next speaker for the day is professor dr chintamani raut he is currently the professor and the head of the department of law at the school of social science nehu shillong dr raut has also been the faculty member at ikfai law school dehradun he has a teaching experience of 27 years and he has 60 publications to his name Dr Raut has presented over 115 papers uh, in national as well as international seminars and conferences among his vast area of knowledge uh, law and women is one of his uh, area of interest so uh, since uh, law and women his is one of his area of interest he is one of the best person today to share his extensive knowledge in this area we are extremely delighted to have dr raut amongst us today i shoktoporni roy assistant professor of law college durgapur on behalf of the entire college welcome sir to the national webinar on crime against women recent issues and challenges over to you sir <laughs> हेलो हेलो यस सर ओ आई एम ऑडिबल ना यस सर यू आर ऑडिबल सो द मिस्टेक सो इट वाज अ क्लिक समवेयर ओके थैंक थैंक यू फॉर नाइस इंट्रोडक्शन टू मी एट द आउटसेट आई ग्रीट्स यू ऑल दैट फॉर योर हार्ड वर्क दैट अरेंजिंग दिस वेबिनार एंड नेशनल वेबिनार एंड वेरी गुड अफ्टरनून टू यू ऑल and first of all i agree to madam uh, that uh, kishori the principal of your durgapur law college and the managing authority also our uh, rahul foundation and rahul ji managing authority and all other faculty members of the law college and the members who have organized also somajit and sir mandal sir also thanks to that professor mani chakraborty who has given a beautiful speech and all details and that he have made easy for me Uh, for the my presentation okay fine so now we are in the covid pandemic and uh, we all are experiencing the very truth which we was been hidden for a quite number of years which we could not uh, uh, realize that these are the the things uh, are that uh, we should address long before and uh, hello uh, sir sorry to interrupt you but your video is not available acha uh, so could you please sorry sir sorry sir very much sorry to interrupt you. Okay. Okay. Now I am available. <laughs> Hello. Yes, sir. It's visible now. Oh, because I am not able to uh, see myself. Uh, my uh, computer might be some wrong. Okay. We are discussing about the crime against women and recent issues and challenges. Acha. This uh, when we talk about a crime, not only against the women, it is against the 
human civilization and humanity. So when we go for the goal worldwide, so we find that 700 crores of populations are there. Out of 50% populations, 350 crores are women also. In India, if we come back, 130 crores of populations are there. Still, we have 65 crores of women. So we are half. And uh, when we go for a smallest unity of the family, and we have parents, we have father and mother. Uh, and we have father and mother. So uh, in a family, we see how we grow and how we develop and how we educate to ourselves. So in this way, a whole world is going up. And when we talk about a crime, and we are paid, and whether it is a crime against woman or crime against a, 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 any of the man, so it is a two sides of the same coin. The first of all, that uh, when we talk about our civilization, particularly we in India, we have mythologies. We know whether in Ramayana or Mahabharata, we see women are being dignified, we have been respected in everywhere. No ill treatment, no or disrespect. And sometimes back after this uh, World War First and Second, uh, World War First and Second, uh, uh, that uh, we see some changes are there. They are really it was uh, ill treatment, crime, and uh, negligences are being arised to the women. We realize. But after sometimes we, when we got independence, particularly in India, we are not talking about the post independence and that uh, past uh, pre independence. In post independence, we find a lot of legislation we have made for the say, development of women and particularly in society. Because when we are talking about one issue of a crime against women, at the same time, as I remember your uh, this uh, uh, management and uh, uh, general manager, that Rahul Foundation, Rahul G told also, this before also, also many of these uh, uh, problems are there. Uh, unemployment is there, illiteracy is there, malnutrition is there. So what not problems? In even nowadays also you realize the health issue is the most important issue and which is no government of the world to be able to manage and we have lost 15 crores of uh, uh, no, 15 lakh of populations are during this one year and india also one lakh 45 thousand till today uh, it will uh, get uh, the death and each state also we find and the same way we find that crime is increasing and the real crime that if we make a legislation whether it is uh, in the Indian constitution we have provided as Dr. Manik Sakravarti has told that whether it is Article 14 or 15 or 16 or Article 21 or Article that 23 uh, that right against exploitation. Even we have made that uh, in that uh, uh, that this uh, uh, upliftment of women making a special legislation. So in this way we have improved, but that was not sufficient. Again we came back uh, to all this. Uh, is, you see, sometimes uh, when we talk about this uh, uh, woman in a family, as I started with the smallest unit, and we talk about marriage, we talk about uh, uh, this uh, uh, adoption, we talk about this session, we talk about the maintenance also. So in this way, you protect uh, a family and a woman and men. And when we talk about marriage also, in marriage law also, we have given equal status to, to men and women. So it is your choice to uh, have a monogamy and to uh, choice a partner. So there also we have not uh, set back giving a right to women and equal treatment we have given. In case of adoption also we have seen that adoption, whether it is a father or a mother, both can uh, go for a adoption also. So that also equality we have seen. Here again succession also. Succession uh, in 1956 in the Succession Act we have certain drawbacks where we are not treated these women as co-personals. But finally in 2006, we have made a uh, Hindu succession act with amendment that equal right for men and women or boys and girls and sons and daughters. So in this way, we have advanced. But the thing is that uh, even if a marriage of a dowry or uh, the dowry provision act 1961, as we have discussed, the thing is that whatever the acts we have made in our legislation, that is a central legislation. The problem that we encounter as a student of law or as a, a civilized society or a civil citizen of the country, we realize that laws are made in the parliament or legislative assemblies. But the, 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 uh, the uh, implementation part, we, we say there are some officers have to be appointed, they have to take care of uh, this law for implementation. 
Take for example, Dowry Prohibition uh, Act, only a simplest act with the same symptoms we find that is a Dowry Prohibition officer in each village or each district or each block. But until now, you find that no such officers are appointed. Because if you go for implementation asking to the state government, they immediately reply that we are crunch of funds. And the state government never come forward for uh, state appointing the officers. Because they blame the central government. Central government only makes a legislation, throws it to the state or implementation. That we have real. Life. So whether it is a, that that child marriage registration act 1929, you forget that. Now you come to the child marriage act 2006. That also you find some disturbances are there. Actually. That also you find that marriage now the if a marriage is there below a 18 of your gun or 21, we find also punishment and equal treatment is there. So in this way you proceed it and we find that everywhere there is some law and implementation part is not there. So you come to that particularly to the Domestic Violence Act 2005. So before that uh, we have tried our best to give justice to the men and women and particularly women as we told that economically, socially, or in some other way, in educationally, we find that we have not given that much of importance to girls' children. Now it is a high time that we have to educate our girls, and thanks to the present government, we are giving equal treatment to the girls and boys, and more importance to the girls for their education, for their upliftment, for their care, for their protection. So as a civil citizen of the country, that's our focus. That we should not go for making a law. Law will be in the law books as Professor Mani Chakraborty has told. So in that way, my focus will be there, the exact implementation of the law by the law implementing authority as well as the civil society. And we cannot be remain silent as a spectator. We cannot speak on criticism. We have to come forward. That is lacking in our society. You see, we have made a very fine piece of legislation that is domestic violence, which in India we have never thought of that this situation will come, the old man inside the family will feel insecure and will uh, face with the uh, harassment, torture, physical or mental, psychological, economic. So that is the basic point that the government wanted to make a law and removing the difficulties for the women uh, because that woman, if he is she is secure and she is protected and she live happily, then children can be also uh, be happy. But that did not take place in any of the families of the uh, 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 India. Either it is any community, we do not go because Article 14 states we are only citizens and we are equal before all law. And there is no discrimination. 15 also says no caste, no color, no religion, no creed, no. Project, no, nothing, sir. And if you go back again, constitution, because constitution is a basic law of the land. That is the, that is the religious book for all citizens, irrespective of community and uh, any uh, uh, culture or religion. So we, the people of India, that we have to solemnly resolve because we have in very separate voice, in a very pious manner, we adopted the constitution with the equality, with the brotherhood, with the fraternity, with the liberty. In, in every form, in a social form, in an economic form, and in a political form. So we have given political achievements we have got, but the social achievement until now we have not received. So thereby, judiciary, the role of the judiciary is very important in our uh, democratic set of like India, and we have find that uh, the judiciary has also played a very important role of bringing and uh, protecting uh, the rights of women. You take, for example, the first case that is Nargis in that case, when a air hospital was appointed and the air India company they limited that uh, at the age of 35, the girl or air hospital should be retired. And that was a challenge in 1982, where Supreme Court came to believe that why there is a discrimination. If a boy is appointed as air hospital and he continued, why a girl will not be? So that was a milestone that open the, uh, the, the the eyes of every citizen uh, that both girls and boys are equal, not in the terms of the law of books, it is has to be in practical. So thanks to the, the Supreme Court that they gave equal rights to the men. And the most important judgment that uh, again also, uh, that, um, that 
Sahabanuk is most important. Where her husband is a million and they, her children were grown up and she was not given a basic needs of food, clothing, shelter, education. So that was the shocking point and she started from judicial magistrate <laughs> second class to highest court of the land. And finally it was interpreted CRPC is sufficient, Article section 125 is sufficient that uh, he or she, whether she com belongs to this category or that category, this community, that community, a citizen or a woman should get this uh, uh, maintenance. So finally, so that was the eye opener to the whole of the country. And one of the most important cases uh, that the Visakha versus the state of Rajasthan also, now to it, thanks to the government of India, we brought the law that sexual harassment, protection of sexual harassment in working places in 2013 also, that gave rise to the strength of the women also uh, with the, uh, living with their dignity and with their status and position. So finally, one case was there, uh, 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 that uh, Sakhi versus Union of India Act 2004, very recent one, where particularly 375 women it is applicable to a accused person of a rape. And uh, the girls, particularly the victim, is very uh, disadvantageous position in the court of the law. And then by the, 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 the prosecution the lawyer, he, he wants to find out uh, the force with the defendant, but defendant lawyer is very strong and very intelligent. They put such a cross questions inside the, the courtroom where the victim uh, feels very shy and awkward to give answers to these questions. Finally, in a 19, uh, 2004, as I told Supreme Court, gave a guideline. So in this type of a cross examination and examination, the the, the defendant lawyer should have to ask in a writing. That how a victim or a girl or woman can answer it in a writing. If he was asked to say a selling open post and that is very impressive. So again also we thanks to the uh, our Indian judiciary who came heavily and uh, suggested good uh, things uh, and women feel uh, up, upgraded. So in this way you, we marched ahead and ahead. In 2005 we got a domestic violence act because the violence or the crime, the offenses could not confine outside in the social or political and economic field. That was dragged to the house itself. Very unfortunately, women uh, saw, find insecurity in the house and particularly in laws were found to be wrong. And sometimes also male members of husband and wife, they, they say father-in-law and they are also responsible. So a fine piece of legislation was brought to our country finding, respecting to women, because a lot of uh, that 20 measures have been taken. And the judicial magistrate, you see, in many of the cases, we also sometimes see surprise how many days, how many years, 10 years, 20 years, uh, a case of uh, murder, theft, docket is taking. So in a uh, domestic violence act, it was prescribed that within 60 days, the judicial magistrate as far as has to dispose of the cases. So either the, the punishment has to be one year or that uh, 10,000 rupees has to be given. Neither it appeal has to be go. So appeal has to go to this uh, this uh, uh, district and session zones. Then it will go on appeal. But before that, some that uh, uh, police officers, uh, that uh, stay homes, uh, protection officers are also being uh, 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 designed to be appointed by the state government to see uh, the, the well-being of a woman who has been suffered or tortured or who comes forward. And you see the data also that each state or national crime bureau data also speaks about the volume is increasing, increasing every year. And uh, it is not disposing. Again, the central government also thought that they should, uh, state government should appoint the fast track course or uh, uh, that uh, it should be expired, expedited also. So unfortunately, this is not happening. We are going to each other, but uh, the state government has a very big role to do. Judiciary is limited. We are not talking about that 50 percent of reservation or 30 percent of reservation. We are not. We are talking about the equal treatment and uh, equal respect and dignity. If that is not that the crime is increasing day by day, and uh, we find that sometimes the police officers are also not coming to the expectation of the people. And they take a oath, enter into a office, but that that does not carried out. So these are the drawbacks. Whether it is a people, people at a whole, or it is some implementing agencies, whether it is a police officers or 
any other uh, officers being appointed on behalf of that legislation that is also not working in many ways we find that um, because conferences are there conventions are there we have already talked about so many con conventions whether the mexico conventions or the beijing conventions lot of provisions are there because it is not india all over the world the same phenomena is going on so only finally we have to see that how to overcome only consciousness awareness because this is a part of our awareness because when we organize a seminar students see and they are young boards they will grow tomorrow they will be citizen and the students also they realize that law is not working and implementation is not there only if we be careful and we will be conscious then 50% of the offenses crimes will be stopped in the society so that sort of thinking and education is required and that good education legal education and all other education are required that is the need of the hour whereby we can break we can stop and we, we can stop this uh, crime we cannot totally uh, that uh, stop it but we will uh, able to stop some percentage of our crimes against women another part is that the mothers have a great role and a sister has a great role and the, the women themselves has to come to the expectation they should not feel that they are inferior so that sort of that mind should not be put into the girl side it was earlier in a joint family in a conservative family it was there so now it is the duty of the parents particularly they have to uh, um, bring their children with such a mindset that nothing is inequality it is equality both boys and girls are to treated equal inside the house and it is not that someone has to be treated in a very uh, better manner and something you know no that is the wrong that as a family as a smallest unit of the family we parents have a great role we brothers and sisters have a good so we we motivate that our girl children know where you are in here because we have already proved in every field whether it is a position of president or prime minister whether it is a judge or the high court or supreme court whether it is a police police officer ips or ias or in a army or whatever position is that we find that women are equally contributing for the development of uh, the society so again we see we are not talking about the animal law or a, a environment law we are talking about the women and who is it the person of the the population of the country and who is contributing in every manner so it is a two wheels of one one car so that's why we cannot be no that realization that feeling that mindset of the change if we respect the old man and we think that the old man can do something and he is equal to us and no way we will be in here crime will stop crime will decrease day by day and the police officer whether it is a woman or police officer or a man police officer everybody has to contribute and judges also they have to in the see before a, a, a case and they, they because that's why it is a blind product that statue of liberty says you have to give balance and you have to give a justice uh, you don't see a man or a woman or a poor or rich or a, a very high and low nothing sir it is equality and equality par equality so if that set of ideas and uh, mentality will come then we will overcome such type of diseases thanks to that covid in some way it is a blessing in this guy that has opened our eyes that we could not take the basic uh, necessities of health like this way whereby people support so let us uh, government do something and we people also to come forward with the expectation and that by something will uh, change and crime will stop and women will feel a uh, dignified life and respectable life and they are our mothers they are our sisters and we have to work together in workplaces also no distinction they are also our teachers so in this way we have to conclude and we have to think of a better society for tomorrow and we have to expect women can be a better partner in every uh, aspect of the life social economic or political or in cultural everything with these words i have stop here and thanks to you uh, all the organizers for giving this opportunity to me and thank and thanks to everyone who was listening to me thank you thank you so much sir for such an informative session sir uh, we have a question from abdul haq uh, sir he has asked that regarding the false accusations that are there the what happens he has asked that what happens in the case 
of false accusations that are there where you know that there are female uh, discrimination that is there but he has asked that what about the men's justice in this case where the female she uh, falsely accuses a man so what happens to the justice of a man you see when we talk about justice it is a very great concept it is a justness fairness and reasonableness whoever because we have started with a law of torts also not law of crimes so it is a civil law and malicious prosecution is there ill will is there and uh, the intention is there motive is there negligence is there so finally we say justice is delayed justice is denied justice is hurried as it was worried but we say uh justice has to prevail without any difficulty of because it is reasonable justice and whenever a judgment will come beyond reasonable doubt so when if complainant is there complainant is there both the cases has to be heard and the person who has falsely or maliciously accused a person even if that be accepted but beyond reasonable doubt no where the, the the case is disposed of both the parties has opportunity to argue for their cases and unless and until there is a evidence and there is a proof and there is a there is not may presume uh, or it is a uh, it is a self proof or a conclusive proof is there so when that the proof will be there in the court of law and beyond reasonable doubt then we cannot say because sometimes malicious prosecution those who filed they are being charged also they have been convicted uh, convicted also so cases will be there we cannot stop that that somebody has alleged somebody has maliciously uh, filed a case that is there that is there but beyond reasonable doubt so somebody has to be proved and somebody has to be convicted it it is there in the society because uh, because some people are very powerful in the name of the caste color religion or power position it is there we cannot deny it cases will be filed some allegations there are false allegations may be there but it is final it is not the people they are deciding the court will decide when the court will decide the court will take reasonable decision and with the evidence and documents that has to prove so if that proved that the malicious prosecution there so the court may charge we again it is not the, the end of on the, the, the justice is not there that person can ask also so this is my defamation that my prestige that my status that my position so the court may ask the charges because you have seen in public utilities and also So the, when that is a fictitious and fallacious cases are there, the court charges them and imposes punishment or uh, the fine also. So in this case, court can ask also. So cases may be there. We cannot stop the cases uh, if it is malicious or it is falsely implicated. It might be there because people want to uh, misutilize their positions. So it is there. It is seen. It is seen. Hello. Yes, sir. So there is one last question. Uh, the student has, uh, the participant has asked about the role of youth, both from the legal and non-legal fraternity, in the preventing sound. crime against women. Sound is defective. So please uh, slowly tell uh, what it is. Sir, uh, he has asked. The student has asked about the role of the youth. from both the legal as well as the non legal fraternity in preventing crime against women yes that's a good question because question has itself answer youth particularly because we are growing old and we are we are leaving this world to be the young one the new generation so youth particularly those are students now whether you are in a professional course or it is in a general course in a professional course so you train in a particular manner that you learn some uh, law and you become advocate and judges you are protector and guardian of this law but those who are in general courses they are also taught with some ethic some knowledge so no where somebody is taught or trained how to commit crime how to commit offense we only taught that any wrongful act is also punishable any crime any offense it is also punishable And whether it is the Indian Penal Code or any other law is there, so we youth can be a law abiding. The point is that we should be disciplined. 
and you see our indian army is so famous in the world because it is only discipline so when discipline is there development is there so indiscipline it creates a lot of huge uh, cry because we are become disobedient and we break the laws so youth has a great role and contribution for the development of the society in terms of peace quality and no such a violence because you treat a, because why we introduced the co education because we can see a girl and boy together and we can exchange their ideas knowledge not that only the bad things bad things to already it has been told in ethics and morality and our consent we should not do all this so youth finally i can say youth has a greater role for contribution of peace love affection and development and no crime uh, is there and if you to be good in mind the mentality is good required whether it is a professional course or it is in a general course you to have a great role fine thank you sir thank you so much for your valuable time we have seen how sir has Uh, discussed about the role of women from the ancient time to the modern time we have discussed about the various legislations how they have helped to keep the status of the women to protect the women in the recent times and then also about the various roles of the state authorities and also he has discussed about the lacunae also and how it requires awareness of the youth the role of youth everything sir has discussed so nicely with us Thank you so much sir for this very informative session we are so grateful to you sir thank you so much sir okay uh, next uh, we will move on to the next session uh, before that i would like to tell you all one thing after this uh, seminar you all are required to fill up a feedback form which will be provided to you all so positively do fill up the feedback form okay so we will now continue with our next session Hello everyone and welcome to today's national webinar on the topic crime against women recent issues and challenges I am Shivani Chattopadhyay assistant professor of law law college Durgapur now I like to introduce third resource person professor dr sanjeev kumar tiwari he was former head department of law badwan university and also he is a motivational speaker and writer of best selling spiritual and motivational books welcome sir would love to hear from you sir good afternoon good afternoon am i audible sir Yes sir, yes sir. You are also there. Sir, are there students in this webinar? Yes sir, there are a uh, lot of students okay. currently present in this seminar. Okay, okay. Okay, <clears throat> good afternoon to all. Uh, my namaskar to uh, Professor Manik Chakorty, uh, my teacher, and uh, uh, Professor Rao, and uh, special thanks to uh, Kishor and Sashina. Who is like my younger brother, Shobodeep, for inviting me, and uh, I also like to thank uh, the principal, Law College Durgapur, for giving me this opportunity of presenting my views in this August gathering. Well, now uh, coming to the topic, well, crime against women uh, is a huge topic, and to speak for a few minutes on such a huge topic. It's like trying to contain the entire waters of Pacific Ocean in a small cup of tea. But uh, still, I would uh, like to give you some input on the topic. Uh, I would like to confine myself to a specific area of 
women rights or women problems uh an area which has assumed a great significance in the present uh, scenario i would like to highlight a particular problem a particular area relating to women which tries to root out the women from the society and if it is not controlled it would lead to serious consequences by adversely affecting the sex ratio in india uh yes i am talking about the uh, female infanticide and female feticide see all of the problems all of the rights relating to women can arise only if the women exist only if the women survive if the women do not survive if there are, are no women in the society in this world then the rights and all the issues related to women would not be there and this human infanticide female feticide challenges the very existence of women in the in the society in our country so india is a unique country because it has unity in diversity uh, and uh, its uniqueness also lies in the fact that it has its shares of ironies and contradictions well do not get me wrong i love my country very much and india has lot of good things but along with the good things the negative side the bad things should also be highlighted so that they could be rectified and addressed in time when as i was saying that india has her share of ironies and contradictions in our country uh, the women are worshiped like ma durga ma saraswati ma shakti on one hand and on the other hand they are molested they are raped sexually harassed and killed in the mother's womb on one hand women fight for their rights for their emancipation and on the other hand the same women when they conceive they uh, wish that a male child be born to them and not a female child so this uh, ironies and contradictions in india has projected india in a very poor light in the foreign countries uh, a few years back i was in tokyo relating to an international conference and uh, there were delegates from 40 countries in that conference and wherever i went i was asked one question dr tiwari what is happening in india we have heard that a girl was brutally raped in the capital city of new delhi where the security is supposed to be the maximum they said that if this is happening in delhi what might be happening in other places of the country they were referring to the nirbhaya rape case which took place at that time the delhi rape case the nirbhaya case had projected the country in a very poor light in the foreign countries it had given an impression that india is not a safe country for the tourists and especially for women in fact i had tried to explain the situation to them i had tried to uh, say that uh, the culprits had been arrested uh, now of course they have been hanged also but at that time they were arrested so i told them that the culprits had been uh, arrested it was an exceptional case and india was a very very safe country for the women for the tourist but uh, i do not know how much i could uh, convince them but seeing their facial uh, expressions i could make out that they were not very much convinced by my answers so now coming to the topic female infanticide and female feticide well female feticide as you all know is the termination of the life of the fetus of the girl child inside the mother's womb and female infanticide is the termination of the life of the girl child immediately after uh, the child is born or sometimes after that in india the sex ratio that is the number of girls per 1000 boys has been declining continuously with every passing decades in the year 1981 the sex ratio was 962 girls per 1000 boys in 1991 it got reduced to 945 girls per 1000 boys and in 2001 it further declined to 927 girls per 1000 boys at present as, as per the latest reports uh, the sex ratio is 913 girls per 1000 boys 913 is the national sex ratio 
and in some states like Punjab, Haryana, Rajasthan, New Delhi, the figure is below 900 girls per thousand boys. So you can well understand the serious uh, situation which we are in. Now let me uh, present to you before uh, before you all some incredible, incredible but true facts to highlight the gravity of the situation. In Rajasthan, there are many villages where no girl has been born for decades. Why? Because they were killed before they were born. There is a village in Rajasthan by the name of Devra, D-E-V-R-A. That village had received a Baran after 110 years. After 110 years, the village received a Baran. You know why? Because in the last 110 years, no girl had got married. Why no girl had got married? Because there were no girls in that village. Why there were no girls in the village? Because every girl born was killed immediately after uh, it was born or in the in the mother's home. So there were no girl child in that village because the girl child would be killed after it was born or uh, in the mother's home. Now let me tell you the methods which are used for killing the girl child for the female feticide. Well, uh, one method is that the mothers, they put uh, poison on the nipples and they breastfeed the child and the child gets killed by taking the poison. This is the first method. Another method is a tub is filled up with milk and then the child is drowned in the tub. And this is done to make it appear that the death was caused by accident and uh, it was not a murder to uh, to make uh, it look like a look like an accident. Third method is chapatis, the rotis. Chapatis are forced down the throat of the child uh, so that it chokes the child by uh, just blocking the breathing channels. This is also done to show that the death was accidental. Another very popular method is the the girl child, the small child, is wrapped in a blanket and the blanket is uh, made wet and then it is placed under the sun, hot sun, so that the child catches pneumonia and it dies. This is also done to show that the death was a natural one. This is a very popular method of killing the girl child, wrapping the child in a wet blanket and keeping it in the sun, hot sun. Another method is affin and uh, pesticides are mixed with the milk and the child is uh, given that milk to kill it. So these are some of the reasons. There are, uh, uh, there are many methods. I give you some, some, some methods. Now, what are the reasons for female feticide and infanticide? You might ask me. Well, there are many reasons, but I will give you just two reasons here due to paucity of time. Two important reasons. First one is cultural preference. There are some scholars and jurists who believe that female feticide is a result of cultural preference. If we go through the history, we shall find that generally the male babies were preferred because they provided manual labors and they were considered necessary for continuing the family lineage. Second, the male baby or the male child was considered an asset because he could earn and support the family. And the female child, the girl child, the daughter was considered a liability since she would be married off to another family and would not be able to contribute financially to the family or the, to the parents. Uh, the third point is that in some culture, only the boys, only the male child is expected to look after their parents in their old age. So uh, this was the reason for preferring the male child. Second reason is the dowry system, which is prevailing in India. In Indian society, men are supposed to be the breadwinners. And so they work in the productive jobs to bring productive inputs in the marriage. Dowry is seen as a transaction money. It is seen as a transaction money to make up for the lack of productive inputs of the women. Since women, they are not allowed to work. They are not supposed to earn uh, money and they cannot contribute financially. So dowry is seen as a transaction money to make up for this lack of protective inputs of women. In other words, women are valued less in marriage partnership and therefore they are asked to pay an amount as a dowry 
to enjoy the benefits which the man which the husband brings in the marriage partnership so this dowry is a huge burden for the parents who have a daughter and female feticide and female infanticide appears to be the best option for these parents to get rid of the girl child so that they do not have to pay hefty dowry when the girl is married a survey was conducted by an ngo atithi and in that uh, survey some shocking uh, facts have come up uh, one of the parents uh, said that it is better to pay rupees 500 now for an abortion then to pay rupees 50000 in future as a dowry see uh, a, a, a mother is saying a mother is saying that it is better to pay 500 now for an abortion then to pay rupees 50000 in the future as a dowry another incident i am going to uh, uh, tell you all so that you can understand the gravity of the of the situation this was also recorded by the ngo aditi a small a girl child was bitten by a mad dog and the father came running to the village doctor and requested him to come with him to treat the child the village doctor he started laughing he started smiling and said that come on you are so fortunate that a uh, mad dog has bitten your child your girl child now see your burden has been lightened by god you are fortunate that you won't have to pay dowry now when she grows up so no headache no tension be happy and go home you are fortunate that god has blessed you in this way god has uh, sent that dog so that it could uh, bite your girl child and uh, she would die and then you wouldn't have to pay dowry when she grows up and is married so this was the answer given by the village doctor to the parent in another the case recorded by the same ngo the mother is saying to a priest she says i am quoting i kept her alive for a month here uh, she is referring to her small daughter one month old daughter she says that i kept her alive for a month and then everyone including my husband would put pressure on me even the relatives and visitors would often say you already have two daughters i could not take could not take it any more one day i gave her three tablets for fever and killed her if again a daughter is born to me i am going to kill her a mother is saying another woman said i had 10 babies i killed seven daughters i now have two sons and one daughter uh when asked about the reason for killing the seven daughters she said now a bangal churi a bangal costs rupees 200 a sari costs rupees 300 how can we afford it if we do not have son and only daughters people will taunt us it had become unbearable for us if get another case recorded by the ngo the mother is saying i had tried to kill my infant girl child by giving her few a uh, fever tablets but she survived then i made one more attempt to kill her this time i gave her 10 pills but this time also she survived now i thought that uh, i should not kill her because uh, god does not want uh, her to get killed therefore i kept her but my husband stopped talking to me after this when i asked the reason for uh, not talking then her husband said that jisse ye chhota sa kaam ek bachcha nahi mara ja sakta wo life mein aur kya karegi this was the reason cited by the husband he said that a woman who cannot kill a small child then what can be expected from such a woman so this husband was not talking to her and in fact he wanted separation from the woman from from the wife because she could was not able to kill a small child uh in another case the women said a buffalo cub mane moisher bachcha a buffalo cub is better than a girl child because it is worth rupees 200 this was the comment of a mother regarding her daughter i i will say once again so that you can realize the gravity of the situation the mother is saying a buffalo cub is better than a girl child because it is worth rupees 200 Now coming to the laws in India for tackling female infanticide and female feticide. 
we have medical termination of pregnancy act which the other speakers uh, spoke on the point medical termination of pregnancy act 1971 amended in 2002 it was passed in 1971 to regulate abortion and it allows abortion up to 20 weeks in three cases in three or four cases for example if the contents of pregnancy would cause risk to the mother's health or life and if the contents of pregnancy would cause trauma to the mother or if there is a substantial risk that the child would be born with abnormalities so in uh, these cases the abortion is the abortion is allowed it's legal in 1994, the parliament enacted the Preconception and Prenatal Diagnostic Techniques Act 1994 to stop female feticide and arrest the declining sex ratio. It banned the sex selection before and after uh, conception and it endeavored to prevent the misuse of prenatal diagnostic acts, uh, uh, methods, techniques. But these two acts, they proved to be a failure, complete failure because of poor implementation, because of lack of political will, because of judicial inactivity and lackadaisical attitude of the judiciary. In most of the cases, the courts uh, have shown reluctance in awarding the maximum punishment to the offenders. In many cases, the offenders were uh, let away with small fine. And in fact, the prosecuting agencies also have shown reluctance in appealing the cases before the higher courts. So all these factors have made these two acts a toothless uh, tiger and just a farce. These two acts have become a joke. I say this because the reports say that in the last two decades, why I'm saying that these two acts have proved to be an utter failure? Because in the last two decades, 10 million girls have been killed either before or immediately after birth by their parents. 10 million girls have been killed either before or immediately after their birth by their parents. And the report of United Nations says that around 2,000 unborn girls, 2,000, mind you, 2,000 unborn girls are illegally aborted every day in India. 2,000 girls illegally aborted in India every day. This is the statistics. You can understand the gravity and the problem. Now, how to overcome this problem? What are my suggestions? What uh, are my observations? First, this is a very common suggestion. You all know law must be made uh, uh, stricter and stringent. It should be law should be made more stringent, more strict. This is a common suggestion. Second, making the law stringent alone will not solve the problem. As the Professor Rao said, in India, we have laws on every issue. In fact, we should be in the Guinness Book of Records for having laws on all the issues, on every aspect. But the problem is with the implementation of the laws. I'm sorry to say that the implementation of laws in India is very, 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 very poor. Uh, I have highlighted this point in many seminars, in many webinars. Once again, I am going to highlight this at the risk of being called a repetitive <laughs> Uh, uh, person, but still I'm going to highlight this to show that how laws are implemented in India. A few years back, we had gone to Supreme Court with the voice of final year. And while we were visiting the courtrooms, we saw uh, an eminent advocate of Supreme Court smoking in front of room number one, which is the room of Chief Justice of India. And when one of our students uh, went there and said that, sir, how can you smoke here? This is a uh, Supreme Court. He said that, my dear young friend, these laws are for the common people. We are the privileged class. So we are not bound by these laws. These laws are for the common people. And he was smoking in, room, in front of room number one, in the very room in which the judgment was passed that smoking is banned in public places. In that very room, the Supreme Court passed the judgment that smoking is banned in public place. And in that, in front of that room, an advocate whose uh, job is to fight for justice, fight for the rights of the people, he was smoking in front of that room. If this is happening in front of the room in which the judgment was passed that smoking is banned in public places, you can well understand you can well realize what might be happening in the remotest village of India where there is no machinery to enforce or implement the laws. 
one day I was coming from my uh, place to Bardwan by local train. So I was sitting at the window. I saw two guys, two young guys smoking uh, in the in the local train. So I protested. I said that, uh, come on, how can you smoke here? This is a public place. This is a train. The young guys told me, Dada, apnar jodi ushubide hotse, tale apni ek tu gateer kaise ge daran, amra kheli tarpor apni abar ese push. So <laughs> if you are having problem, then please go for five minutes and stand near the door. So when we have finished, you can again come back. So this is <laughs> this was their reaction. So uh, I cannot fight with them in, in the local train. I cannot get physical with them and start uh, fighting with them. So I was happy that at least I, I, I protested. I was not a mute spectator. I, I just uh, pro protested. Now compare this uh, implementation of laws with the laws in Dubai. I was in uh, Dubai for a few days relating to a conference. And uh, one day while I was uh, walking on the footpath with my uh, nephew, uh, my, my nephew uh, suddenly felt some irritation in his throat. He felt some irritation in his throat and he spat on the ground. Hello? Yeah, uh, sorry, it's a connection drop. Oh, so he spat on the throat. He spat on the on the footpath. Then suddenly, uh, two policemen from nowhere they. Uh, he came there and uh, they showed their eye cards and uh, said that uh, you have uh, uh, spat on the on, on the footpath and this is not allowed so you have to pay a fine which amounted to around uh, 7000 rupees in indian money so we have to pay a fine of 7000 rupees for uh, spitting on the on the road in fact they have cctv cameras uh, everywhere in dubai and uh, this is how they are implementing their laws. Well, you can say that Dubai is a rich country, India is a poor country, India does not have the infrastructure of Dubai, so it's very difficult. Uh, it's, uh, I, I agree. But see, you have to have a political will. That is also a very uh, important thing. We do not have that political will to implement the laws. And uh, that is a major concern. Uh, the third point, the women must be empowered, as Professor Rauth and Dr. Manik Shirvati also said, that uh, the women must be empowered socially and financially by formulating various schemes, policies, etc., etc. These are common suggestions. Now, the fourth point, which is very important, and this is the root of all the problems. The gender of law in India should be changed from male to neutral. At present, what I feel that the law in India is of masculine gender. Law in India is male, it's not a neutral. Why I say this? I say this because I feel that the laws are made in India, keeping in mind the male perspective, the male thinking, the male understanding of jurisprudential principles. The thinking of women, the perception of women is not kept in mind while making the laws. I will prove this by some facts. Uh, the point which I am trying to drive home is that the see, Indian society is a patriarchal society, we all know. And uh, in such a patriarchal society, even the laws, when they are made, they are made with this patriarchal thinking in mind. The women perception, the female thinking, the, the female thinking, sorry, the female per uh, perception is not kept in mind. I will give you just a uh, uh, Two uh, examples to prove this point. See, to test uh, to test whether the rice in the pot has boiled or not, you don't have to test each and every grain of the rice. If you test just one or two grains, and if uh, they are they are boiled, then you can come to the conclusion that all the rice grains in the pot has uh, have, have got boiled. Okay. So I will take out just two grains from the pot of Indian legal system. To prove my point, you might have heard about. Uh, surely, you might have heard about the Air India versus Narges Mirza case, which took place in 1981. Air India versus Narges Mirza. What was the law or the rule which was challenged here? Regulations 46 and 47 of Air India Employee Service Regulation was challenged. Now, what did uh, rules 46 and 47 say? 
under rule 46 it was provided that an air hostess service would be terminated or she would be compulsorily retired if she married within four years of joining her service or on her first pregnancy this was rule 46 and 47 that the service of air hostess would, would be terminated if she gets married within four years of joining the service or on her first pregnancy that means if she gets pregnant she will be thrown out of her job this was rule 46 well motherhood is a very pious obvious blissful and sacrosanct phenomenon and if a woman attains this pious this sacrosanct this uh, 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 this uh, uh, natural and blissful state she would be thrown out of her job what kind of law was this and who made this laws? Is this a civilized, civilized society in which we are living? And who were these uh, brutes who made this jungly law? Well, they were not brutes. They were just uh, normal people like us, but with patriarchal mindset. They made these rules, they made these laws with a patriarchal mindset. Another example, Hindu Minority and Guardianship Act 1956. What does the act say? The act says that in case of minor Hindu boy and in case of unmarried minor girl, the natural guardian will be the father and after him the mother. It means that as long as the father is alive and fit, the mother will not be the natural guardian of the Hindu child. A mother who keeps the child in her womb for nine months, who nurtures the child takes care of the child and uh, struggles so much, she bears so much pain while delivering the child. That mother will not be a natural guardian of the child and in her place father will be the natural guardian. What kind of uh, law was this? What, uh, law, law is this? Why not make father and mother the joint guardian? Why give preference to the father and not the mother? In fact, mother should have been the uh, first natural guardian of the child. And after that father, the best thing would have been to make the father and child, the joint, uh, uh, the, sorry, the father and the mother, the joint guardian. But this was not done because the law was made with the, the patriarchal mindset, keeping the male perspective, keeping the male thinking, the male perception in mind and not the women perception or women thinking. That is why I said that law in India is of masculine gender, it's not of neutral gender. It is of masculine gender. Law is a male, not a female or a neutral. Now, the thing therefore lies in the mindset. Until unless this mindset is changed, making the laws is not going to help because it will not get a pro proper implementation. Look at the Indian mythology. Uh, as Professor uh, Manu Chagurthi, I think uh, he quoted Manu. Manu had said a lot of good things about, uh, about uh, Indian tradition, Indian culture their religion but he has said some bad things also manu had said uh, at one place dhol gavar sutra pasu nari ye sab taran ki adhikari i will translate it in english he said that dhol dhol means you all know drum gavar means a fool sutra you all know and pasu pasu is animal and nari woman so these five categories of people should be beaten always to keep, keep them under control because if they are not beaten then they will not be under control they should be beaten regularly because they otherwise they will become uncontrollable this was what was said by manu at one place at another place, in Manu court, it was said, how God made a woman? He says, God took the strength of a diamond and sweetness of honey. Then he took the cruelty of a tiger and warmth of the fire. Then he took vanity of the peacock and timidity of the hare. And then he took lightness of the leaf and glance of the fawn. And then he mixed all these ingredients in a mixer and 
then the output which came out that was woman and he gave to the man and said now play with her the gift was given to the man and said god said now you can play with her so this was the thinking about the woman and that is why i'm saying that indian society was a patriarchal society everything was made with the patriarchal set of mind see uh, manu has said many good things indian mythology there are many good things indian religion there are many good things but only those things were highlighted only negative things were highlighted were brought before the people which perpetuates the patriarchal mindset which helps in perpetuating the male dominance and importance of man and subjugation of women that is why see only this negative things were highlighted not the positive things of intelligent intertradition all this because the people with patriarchal mindset wanted these things to be highlighted so that they can subjugate the women they could control the women and they could perpetuate the male dominance in bible also look at bible what is what is in bible what it is said it is said that if if the first woman she induced the first man adam to commit sin by eating that apple which god has uh, told them not to eat so what impression does it give it gives an impression that men are basically good but it is the woman who makes him an evil person and pollutes him so the point which i am trying to drive home is that society is basically patriarchal the thinking of the people of the society is patriarchal while making laws relating to women the women experience the women perception the women perspective is not kept in mind only the male angle male experience and the male norms are kept in mind in fact the methodology methodology of legal reasoning is also patriarchal and is based on the male moral reasoning and the and a uh, and under, under such a scenario it will be very difficult to make a law which will be beneficial to the women uh see look at the word human rights human rights h u m a n human rights uh human see in human the word man is there man is there but the word woman is not there h u m a n human means the man the woman and of course now the third gender is also included but see in the word human we can find only man the woman is not there you might say that well uh, uh, why do you put so much stress on 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 the literal meaning in spirit it includes everything but even literally why should that word not contain a woman also why it should contain a man what impression does it give it gives an impression that human beings only men are considered women women are not considered as a woman that is why there are some some feminists who have suggested that the word human rights should be changed should be amended and the new word should be wo human rights wo human w o h u m a n wo human rights so that the women and men both are included in that word wo human right w o h u m a n wo human right uh see the word women and men this uh, i'm highlighting this to to show the practical thinking of the people who had coined these words the people who had coined these words see man and woman see in woman the word woman w o m a n man is there wo man w o m a n a man is sitting in that word what does it imply it, imp- it implies that a woman is not independent she cannot live without a man she always needs the crutch of the man to stand she has no independent existence but in man the word man see man m a n there is no woman what does it imply that man is independent he does not need the support of woman uh, man has an independent thinking and he does not need uh, any kind of support from the woman so this words also get coined with a with a practical perspective and practical uh now coming to the last part uh, last part of my presentation i would like to say that uh,
see the mindset as i as i said should be changed without changing the mindset without changing this practical mindset and without making the law neutral nothing is going to improve and how now this uh, mindset is going to change the next question you will ask me the students uh, uh, who are watching this program will certainly ask me sir what are your suggestions for changing this mindset because until and unless this mindset is changed nothing is going to improve as you said well to change the mindset only solution is which swami vivekan has had provided almost 200 years back he said that by imparting a man making education by imparting man making education to our children we can change the mindset as professor rao uh, had uh, suggested now what is this man making education well the education which we are imparting in the schools and colleges these days is not a man making education we are only just uh, teaching the students how to learn some formulae how to learn some some uh, some uh, formulas and uh, some equations and then vomit those equations on the answer scripts get good marks and get a good job we are teaching them how to make a living we are not teaching them how to live we are not teaching them how to solve the problems of life we are not teaching them values see if uh, you have scored 80% in human rights paper 80% in your human rights paper but if you do not help uh, an old person dying in the street then your 80% mark sheet in human rights should be thrown in the dustbin it's of no use if you have scored 90% in your environment law paper but if you do not plant a sapling if you do not plant a, a, a tree in your life then your 90% environment law mark sheet should be thrown in the dustbin it's of no use so whatever we have studied we should try to implement those things in our life we teach our students human rights we teach about the conventions of human rights but we do not do not teach them how to implement that knowledge in our real life we do not teach them how to help an old dying man uh, in the street so this is what is needed and here the job of as professor rao said the job of the teachers the primary school teachers the job of the parents becomes very important because the parents the primary school teachers they are the people who can change the mindset of the child from the very beginning because they can uh, input those impressions in their mind which can make them a real man when they grow up if a child is told from the very beginning 100 times 1000 times that it is better not to steal it is better to die than to commit theft it is uh we should respect uh, the women of our country women they are symbol of motherhood if these thoughts are uh told to these uh, children thousand times till these thoughts enter their brain cells till every uh, drop of blood tingles with this idea then these ch children when they grow up they will become a real man they will start respecting the women they will have good values and that is why i'm saying the role of the parents the role of the teachers becomes very important because they can play a very very vital role in changing the mindset of the uh, children and before i end just a small anecdote which i have repeated in so many seminars the balloon man the balloon man story there was a balloon man he used to sell different colored balloons uh, in the melas the fairs so one day he was uh, releasing some gas balloons in the sky red color blue color white color and black a uh, black skin boy a negro boy was watching the balloon man releasing those different color balloons in the sky so he went to the balloon man and asked if you release a black colored balloon would that also go up in the sky since he was he was a black skin person he was concerned with the black balloon the balloon man told him my dear friend it is not the color of the balloon that determines whether the balloon will go up in the sky it is what is inside the balloon the gas the helium gas decides whether the balloon will go up in the sky so if you ask me what is that inside which makes a man go high up in his career in his life that uh, inside that uh, thing is your attitude your positive attitude your positive mindset the day we start obeying our laws not out of fear but out of love that day the things will start improving otherwise 
there is no hope. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I once again thank the organizers and everybody uh, associated with this program for uh, giving me this opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for this invitation. Sir, beautifully pointed out or addressed the recent earning issues or challenges relating to declining sex ratio in India, female puticide, female infanticide, nirvara case, yarinia versus nargis nija case, etc. Once again, thank you, sir. Thank you for this. Now, I request you can to sir to put up hands. Welcome to Swami Vivekananda Singh. Just as a God cannot fly with one wing only, a nation cannot march forward if the women are left behind. Men and women are the two ways of the party. Their strength is born of their union. Their separation results in weakness. Each has what the other doesn't have. Each completes the other and is completed by other. The relation of the male and female is very well illustrated in our many person by the analogy of mind and matter, which means that man and woman are closely associated with each other as the soul and body. Therefore, the woman ought to be respected. Uh, I should start uh, with Professor Dr. Manik Chakraborty. Thank you, sir, for enlightening us uh, as to how we can show respect from international perspective. Thank you, sir. Uh, we shall remember every word that you have uttered on this occasion. Then I would like to move on to Dr. Chintamuni Raut. Thank you, sir, for making such a splendid academic discussion. So uh, we will try to remember your advice in the days to come. And uh, Finally, uh, I would like to, um, uh, I very uh, sorry to say, I don't have any word to uh, give a compliment for Professor Sanjeev Kumar Tiwari. He nicely depicted the latest situations of women in and across the country. Thank you, sir, for enlightening us with your ideas, with your knowledge. I once again uh, like to express my heartfelt thanks on behalf of Law College Durgapur to the GMC Rahul uh, Foundation and uh, my sincere thanks also extends to principal Dr. Law College Durgapur and with this I, I would like to conclude both of my session. Over to Sonali for the next time. So, Nelly, please, uh, uh, if, if the time permits, conclude the session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, SKB sir. Thank you, Chintamani sir. Thank you, Manik sir, for being there with us for all this time, being patiently being there for the technical error that we had. Thank you, everyone, and it was a great honor and privilege to have you all, sir, with us. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir, I'm ending this session. Thank you, sir. Okay. Okay, thank you, everybody.